2010 may seem a little late to launch a PlayStation 2 product, but that's exactly when this PlayStation 2 TV was launched. Also known under the incredibly marketable name of the Sony Bravia KDL22PX300 LCD TV, this package consists of a 22 inch Bravia television cunningly mounted onto a base containing a PlayStation 2, whilst also serving as the stand. But why? And how? And indeed, why? Well, as the noughties rolled on, and with the PlayStation 3 having been on sale since November 2006 internationally, or March 2007 for us in Europe, the story goes that Sony found themselves with some surplus PAL region PlayStation 2 hardware, and were looking for somewhere to shove it without digging a huge pit in the desert. Technically, in some regions, the PS2 was actually available in retail until 2013, with the slimline version introduced in 2004, making up the bulk of later sales. So maybe this was a side project for the work placement lad. In any case, it was a stroke of genius. As we all know, the PS2 was a huge success, partly because of an ace up its sleeve, the ability to play DVDs. Many people grabbed one after launch as it was actually cheaper than buying a new DVD player, essentially killing two birds with one stone. Of course, a console built into a television wasn't a new concept by now. It had been attempted with varying success, mainly in Japan and on a limited scale. But having a DVD player built into TVs was commonplace by the late noughties. So if you could get a PS2 for free as well, why the hell not? The PS2 library was vast, and there were people still enthusiastically engaged in their 10-year-old kit, so it made perfect sense. By late 2010, news outlets were spreading word of this TV like wildfire. There were rumours of European availability and the possibility of it coming to the United States. However, Sony weren't officially pushing the product, whatever that means, and so its arrival was a limited one, making its way only onto UK shelves and only stocked by certain branches of the retailer Richer Sounds. Its December arrival was early enough to hit the Christmas sales, and priced at £200, stock didn't last long. It made the perfect purchase to stick in the bedroom, gaining a TV, DVD player, CD player, and gaming device in one fell swoop. But yet its exclusivity remained a limited one, and once the UK stock had sold, the TV was no more. So allow me to share mine with you, because it's actually a pretty nice package. As you can see from the label, mine is indeed from December 2010, and behind that label is your typical Bravia television, offering a very decent image quality. It outputs at up to 720p and offers a whopping four HDMI ports on the back, well, two on the side, two on the back, but still four. That's more than most TVs today have. Plus, these ports can all accept 1080p signals, even if it only pushes them at 720. We've also got an Ethernet connection for the TV, a VGA in, components in, SCART in, aerial in, and over here we have both digital and phono sound outputs. Along with those side HDMIs, we can also find our standard composite connections and the legally standard PCMCIA slot for upgrade, subscription services, and the like. We've also got a USB socket there and a headphone output. So this TV is well specified for connections, and we don't sacrifice any inputs for the PS2 as it's wired directly into the TV. It would have been nice if the TV Ethernet connection also connected with PS2, but unfortunately that has its own port next to its own optical out. Still, at least it has one, unlike the original PS2 models. 
but it does confirm how this thing was just pieced together. I mean, this PS2 is literally bolted to the bottom. Rather flushly, of course. I mean, it didn't fall out of Dave's DIY den, but it does kind of limit your wall mounting options. Still, at least we only have one cable coming out of it. The power cable with a standard British plug. I'll just run you over the standard television functions to begin with. The menu works just like the PS2 menu, which is nice. We've got a digital tuner, which I attempted to tune in with this pathetic joke of an aerial. I found nothing. For old times sake, I tried the analog tuner as well. As you'd expect, absolutely nothing. I thought about plugging in a spectrum and going, oh look, it's found a rogue spectrum signal from the past, but then I thought, don't be bloody ridiculous, get a grip, man. We can also connect up to that fangled internet thing and access on-demand services such as YouTube, Love Film, Blip TV, and even Picasa. Well, we could if the services still worked. The TV can connect to the internet, no problem. It's just these services, or at least the software to connect to them, are now obsolete, and I can't even update them. Back in 2010, the £200 price tag made this one of the cheapest smart TVs available at the time, and that's not even considering the built-in PlayStation. However, one gripe owners seemed to have back in 2010 was the TV's inability to load iPlayer, the BBC On Demand service. It seems strange that almost every other internet-ready Bravia TV could do so. Maybe the software, or even the hardware they pieced together, just wasn't capable of this task. Still, the TV will connect to local media devices, so you can look at pictures or just listen to obscure game soundtracks you have on a local storage device. Somewhere. I have no idea where that is. Sony have also thrown in their own MP3 to create some atmosphere. Actually, I should say, the speakers are pretty damn good in this thing. Groundbreaking. It also has Div X codex for watching various video formats. Of course, we can also watch DVDs through the PlayStation. The manual states we need to either use a controller or the PS2 remote to access the DVD controls, but the Bravia TV remote actually does the job just fine, allowing me to observe Burke on a whopping 22-inch screen. Remember, this would have been huge back in the 80s, even if it's now considered pretty small. Being a PAL machine, it doesn't play NTSC discs, so I won't be able to watch Brogan's Adventures from this American box set of Space Precinct, which is a shame. Anyway, let's play some games. Oh, I was just testing the HDMI ports work. Don't get your knickers in a twist. So if we take a detailed look at the front panel, you might notice that placement wise, it's similar to the PS2 Slim. In fact, its internals are made up from PS2 Slim stock, most likely the size reduced 90,000 models. I couldn't tell you which board revision precisely is in it, but we do get a revised BIOS, showing the model as PX300 rather than SCPHXXXX. More obvious differences are, rather than having a flip open DVD tray, we get a satisfying button which pops open a sliding door. It's very nice. Like the PS2 Slim, the front reveals controller ports, memory slots, and two USB connectors to the right. Also, like the various Slim iterations, there's no iLink connector and you can't slip a hard drive in this thing. So, no Final Fantasy XI, I'm afraid, but given the online servers shut down in 2016, that's not much of an issue, really. Of course, being an LCD, you won't be able to play any light gun games either, but come on, no one really cares. 
actually, if you've got an Amtrak gun, it actually looks quite good fun. So maybe I do care just a little. To launch the console, we simply press the button on the remote, which flicks to the PlayStation channel, and then we can power on the console. Now remember, the PS2 arrived in a world which was still predominantly using 4x3 screen ratios, and where HDMI didn't even yet exist. However, the console can output a progressive scan mode of 480p. As indicated, the resolution boots up in 576i, which is the standard interlaced mode for PAL regions. But we can tell the PlayStation to switch to progressive, usually by holding down the triangle and X buttons on load. The fact this works tells us that the console is wired up in a method akin to component connections, and without the signal noise associated with some of the later thick PlayStation 2 models. So we're getting the best the PS2 has to offer here. Some games offer a progressive scan option in their options menu, although to be honest, the difference is sometimes hard to notice. As well as changing the screen mode, I've dimmed the lighting here to create a better atmosphere for Spy vs Spy, one of my favourite 8-bit games, and this modern version is actually pretty damn good. Of course, if we're using progressive scan, we're likely to be using a 16x9 screen format. We can change to this mode in the options screen. In fact, we can change to all manner of screen formats, but actually I find the default smart setting works quite well. It offers a compromise between the huge 4x3 borders and distorting a standard 4x3 picture excessively. Purists can of course set the correct screen format for the particular game they're playing. Still, it's not a given that every game supports progressive scan or even 16x9. In fact, most don't, especially in PAL regions, and therefore some games will drop into a standard 4x3 interlaced mode. There are ways to force a PlayStation into particular screen modes using Codebreaker or a number of homebrew integrations such as Free McBoot, but the later slim boards removed the exploit which allowed you to boot from memory card, therefore I don't have that option here. But in any case, the screen modes look pretty nice through the Bravia display. For me, the PS2 is the point where games made that jump from what I'd call old into a modern looking game. Of course, the PS2 is backwards compatible with PS1 games. Some people may have experienced issues running PS games over component cables, given most run at 240p or 288p for us limeys, but with the PS2 TV there is no issue. PS1 games run and look absolutely splendid, even with the side borders. Actually, this could take a while. Best you uh, come back later? Ok, let's wrap up with some PS2 stuff again. I thought I'd give Gran Turismo 4 a whirl because it's one of the few games that can actually run at 1080i. But then I remembered, this is the PAL version of the game, which doesn't have that functionality whatsoever. So I'm stuck with good old 576i. Even so, it looks pretty sweet. It's just a shame I can't play for sh. So there we have it, the PS2 TV, a bit of an oddity, but like most odd things, fascinating nonetheless. Well, it is for me at least, despite how relatively modern it is. So thanks for watching, uh, click somewhere here for more, support me through Patreon, subscribe, yada yada, have a great evening.